never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you work it Even when I don't feel it, you work it You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working sing a new song this morning. Why don't you sing along with us? I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along.
Welcome. We are so excited that you're joining us online today. Music worship was awesome. I love it. And in a few moments, we get to hear Pastor Daryl. Oh, it's been great. We muscled through uh, Pastor Micah and Pastor Darius last couple of weeks, but today, the real deal. Kind of, that kind of hurts. You, oh, but you did great. You did great. Thanks. You did great. Thanks. Hey, we want to say thank you for the ways you've practiced generosity. Your giving is helping people find and follow Jesus in our cities and around the world. See, I, I love to practice generosity because it's two parts. It's obedience to how Jesus has instructed me to order my life, mm -hmm. but it's also awesome to see what he does as I practice generosity with that little bit of, of my finances. If you want to give right now, you can do that in the comment section. Um, but you guys see what I mean, right? Thanks for joining us today. Stick around till the end of the message because I have two critical information items that I want to share with you, and I hope you'll be able to hear them today. You know, we have four children. Gail and I have been married 41 years, and uh, four kids. Many of you know them, but we've always wanted our kids to succeed. I mean, I think every parent does, right? They want their kids to succeed and kind of move ahead and so on, to be in a position to come out on top and have confidence and so on. So whether in games, which we played a lot of games, we homeschooled, we did a lot of games and teaching our kids, uh, whether it's education, maybe sports, whatever it was, life, we did what we could to help them. Oftentimes, behind the scenes, they didn't even realize what we were doing to help them in this process of getting ahead in life. Why? They were our kids. They were our kids. They're Johnsons. Uh, you know, we're endeared to them, their family. So we had their best interest in mind, even though they may not have felt like that at times, we always had their best interest in mind. And uh, it doesn't mean that we manipulated everything and, and caused it so that they always won, that they always succeeded because you recognized 
Life is not, you're not always going to win. You're going to have problems. You're going to have times that are difficult. So you need to be prepared to win, but also sometimes to lose, sometimes to fail. Sometimes it was necessary that they experienced life and uh, decided for themselves. We wanted them to learn to decide for themselves and also to learn to live with the consequences of some of those decisions. But uh, when, when it was within our means, uh, certainly we were behind the scenes doing what we could to guide them, to protect them, to prosper them. I remember our oldest, Brent, if you know Brent, he's always been a competitive guy and, and he loved to win. He was very competitive, whether in a game of basketball or a board game or whatever it was. And I would play along or we'd play along and I knew the rules better. I knew strategy better than he did at that young age. I knew the pitfalls of doing this move rather than this move. And, and so I just sit quietly and when he was younger, I would try to set him up for the win. I'd set him up for the win. I wanted him to be a success in it. But as he grew older and older and he got a little more confidence, a little more skills and so on, one thing I realized became real apparent to me was it was more and more difficult to beat him and to win. So now, and I just give up. I won't play a game with him. He's so strategic. And now it's, but here's it. In, our, in their teenage years, what we did with our kids was this. I remember this so many times. Just before they'd go out the door on a date or an activity with the youth group or wherever they were going, I would say to them, or Gail would say to them, remember who you are and whose you are. Remember who you are and whose you are. You know, today we wrap up our series on who do you think you are? Romans chapter 8. Pastor Micah launched it, did a great job, marvelous job, and, and then last week, Pastor Darius as well, a great job with it. And if you, didn't, if you weren't able to watch those, you can go onto our website and you can watch the past uh, messages there. But as I close out, they're bringing in the closer uh, out of the dugout, Romans chapter 8, I realize this, and this is the thought that I walk with today. When I think about who and whose you are, God set us up. God set us up. Let me explain that a little bit. He has our best interest in mind. Always has. He won't let us flounder and fail and, and so on. Our passage reminds us that we're in his hands, that he has a plan. He's orchestrating and things won't always go our way, but he always does what he can to guide and protect and direct our steps. If I had my kid's best interest in mind, how much more so does our Heavenly Father have your best interest in mind? Remember who you are and whose you are. And know this, God sets you up. And we're going to talk for more about that. We live in a time of great uncertainty right now. We all know that. And there's a fear of the future that seems to be all around us. And some people, some maybe here today as you're listening, watching, you hold some of those fears and you're anxious. And we've talked about that. If you asked me a couple of months ago, if I would never have predicted that we'd be in a situation we're in today. I'd never heard of COVID-19. Uh, I didn't know what the coronavirus was. I thought it was a bad drinking problem probably. But uh, anyway, we've, we've had great scares before as a country, as a people. I mean, some of them you remember, some we don't. The Spanish flu, nah, most of us wouldn't. H1N1, yeah, okay, that's a little more familiar. The Ebola virus, these we get, the AIDS virus, we get these. We've heard some of these names. And all of them were eventually contained, or at least harnessed to some capacity. And uh, after some scare, after some death, certainly. And here we are again now, full circle, we come back to this, and it's an uncertain time. We don't know how many are going to be infected, how many people are going to die every day. I look on the news report to see how many new cases in the Tri-Cities, how many people have passed away. Why? Obviously, there's a concern there, but also from the aspect of our church and when we're going to be able to open our doors again, it's conditional by our governor, 
based upon how many new cases are in our community. So there's a special interest there, maybe a selfish interest. In the meantime, which is where we usually live, isn't it? Our church continues to serve the community. And you're still doing life and showing Jesus, I hope, to your family and to your neighbors and friends and so on. And, uh, and so, but there's still questions. And COVID-19 is scary to many of us. Why? Because they haven't found the vaccine. They haven't found the answer yet. And there's still some unknown things that are emerging on it. But we know, Scripture talks about, we don't live in a spirit of fear. We're not to just kind of wander in that. And so it's learning to live with a sense of trust and live responsibly. And that's why we're asking people to be considerate. We want to open the doors to this building but we're trying to be considerate of the neighbors, considering those vulnerable, and we're developing a strategy, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about at the close of the message today. Understand this. Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul wrote these words, penned the words, and he wrote them. When he wrote them, the people he's writing to were faced with many challenges, things that were beyond themselves, that they really didn't know how they were going to handle and maybe survive. But pick it up with me today in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you have your Bible with you, you can, you can follow along there or just listen if you like. But in verse 31, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charges against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What's he saying? As we've seen the last couple of weeks, when his spirit lives within us, when we put our hand in his hand, when we walk with Jesus, here's what happens. He enables us to say no to ungodliness, those things that would take us down the road, he enables us to say, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go that direction. We're not helpless. That's what he's reminding us of. We're not helpless anymore. His Holy Spirit lives within us and walks with us. And the more we learn to walk and to live in his spirit, he guides us. Now, we still have choices. You and I still have the ability to make the choice. But what happens is the longer we walk with Jesus, we learn how to choose and why to choose certain things. Now, will difficult choices confront us? Absolutely. Will we face challenges? Certainly. Will we find ourselves experiencing difficulties? Yep. Will everything always be perfect? Nope. That's not the promise. Will we be alone? No, never. He says never. It's interesting. Paul wrote here in the Romans, as well as much of the New Testament, many of the books that we see in the New Testament. And yet I think about his life. Did he ever have to face difficulties? Did uh, he experience things that didn't seem right, weren't fair? Were there things that he fully didn't understand at the time? Were there times he felt alone? Yes to all of these, but he came to a place in his life and in his walk where he knew who he was and he knew whose he was. 
And it was as he learned to walk and not simply focus on his circumstances and situations on earth that he began to develop a perspective. And it's that perspective that helped to guide him through his life. And in turn then, to pen the words that would guide us through our lives today. <clears throat> this is why he could say what he says in Romans 8, 28, a verse that's become a favor to many, although oftentimes misquoted and misunderstood. But look at what it says. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. All things work for good. It's not conjecture. It's not happenstance. It's not, well, perhaps it will. It's not maybe. But it's an ironclad certainty. An affirmation of God's word. He, is, he will set you up. He will help you. Now, it's often misquoted. He didn't say all things are good that happened. No, it doesn't say that. Rather that even in the midst of difficulties, that's what he's trying to get the backdrop. Even in the midst of difficulties, God can orchestrate it. for He can bring it about good in your life. And he can bring it for good in your life. He'll develop your character through it. He'll develop, maybe help shape some values in your life. He'll help you gain a new perspective <laughs> or set of lenses that you look at situations in. Even in my poor choices, even in struggling through the consequences, I have a confidence. He has my best interest in mind. And he's working behind the scenes to set me up in a positive manner for his kingdom. God will cause everything in our lives to become beneficial, spiritually profitable, useful, helpful, good for us. And God allows everything in our lives for one of two purposes. Let me share them with you. Either to bring us closer to himself or to mold us to be more like his son. And you see, sometimes we forget this isn't the end here. This isn't our home. That's why scripture refers to it like this. He says, we're aliens. Look at the person sitting next to you in your home and say, yep. And, uh, yeah, but we get it. I mean, we're aliens, someone that are in a place that's not really where they're supposed to be. Or they're not intentionally there. That's not their homeland, if you will. And so here's what the Bible calls it. It says our lives are like vapors. And why does it say that? It's trying to give us perspective, God's perspective. That in, in, in light of eternity, we're like a snap of our fingers. That's what it is. We're only passing through. And unfortunately, too many of us find ourselves building in the lobby, if you will, and not even getting into the main event. It's kind of like Disneyland. Many of you have been to Disneyland. You know, the first time I was at Disneyland, I was just a little guy. And we came through the gates. And I remember you come into that little city, community, walkways, and I was just in awe, looking. And they usually have the characters there to greet people and stuff and take pictures. And I remember being there thinking, this is incredible. Disneyland, we're here. Little did I know, this is just the lobby. This is just the entry. There's so much more beyond that. Paul says elsewhere, this is what he said, in fact, in Ephesians 3. In spite of all the stuff going on in his life, the pain, the injustice, all these things. He says this in verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long, how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And then he wraps it up in verse 20, what we often use as a benediction. And it says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church, 
and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. You see, how could he say that? He had learned the benefit of keeping his eyes at the end on the goal. He learned the prize and the, the goal at the end was what he needed to focus on, not the circumstances, not the situations. He knew whatever happened here was temporary. And in light of eternity, it was meaningless. God has so much, much more in store for us. When this was written, the first century church Christians often fought diligently for physical and spiritual survival. They were oppressed. There were things going on all around them, and hardships caused them to wonder and doubt, and even if, if their newfound faith would be defeated, what's going to be the end result? And I think that's why in Romans 8, Paul assured them that you're going to face trials. Be aware that you're going to face these things, but God will bring you through. He'll set you up for a win in the end. And uh, there were crucial moments in Paul's life, certainly, when he faced those things. But when it reminds us as we read those, that when we feel defeated, when we're wronged, even when we're doing the right thing, Paul told them, God's got your back. God's setting you up. He's on your side. And he reminds you and I of that. He invites us to step into that and remind ourselves his Holy Spirit is working within us. And I think that's why he said those words to bring confidence and courage. And it has to me, if God be for us, who could be against us? Who could be against us? The logical answer? Nobody. Nobody. No one can feed us. Because God is the ultimate power. And at times we may feel like we're fighting against the power, or powers which are too great to defeat. And yet we're reminded through scripture and down through history that even in spite of temporary appearance of victories, that God intervened and he stepped up. Nothing should shake our confidence in Christ's ability and in his forgiveness for our lives. We're plagued with cruel events of this world, poor self-images, lop lopsided understandings of Scripture and even God's nature. So we don't really get it. God's true feelings for us, his love for us. But God's unveiled. He's pulled back the curtain, so to speak, so that we could catch a glimpse of it in Romans 8 <clears throat> and remind us we don't need to fear and through Ephesians 3, that we can stand and walk in that love that he gives us. And not even death or angelic beings or time or distance or anything else in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God. And Paul's crowning statement in all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. The actual word there in the original language says conquerors of all. When I read that, I think he's setting us up to win. And I've read the back of the book, and in the book of Revelation, in the end, it says, to he who overcomes, to those who hang in there till the end, and they're victorious in the end. And I love that passage. I love that reminder. Remember who you are and whose you are, and that God's on your side, and he's setting you up for the win. When I was at Northwest University, I played soccer. And uh, we, I loved to travel. The team would travel to Oregon, up to Canada to play. And one year we were league champions. And uh, now I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking, he's built to run for a long time. But believe it or not, when I was in college, I did run a lot up and down soccer on the soccer field. And, but uh, what made our team great the year we won the championship were two things. One was a missionary's kid, Randy Chastagner from the Ivory Coast, where they grow up playing soccer all day long. Another was a guy named Michael Irving. Michael Irving was from Kenya. What do you know about Kenyans? They can run all day. 
And this guy could run all day. And he was so good as a soccer player. And he would come down. I was playing fullback. He was a striker. He'd come down the field. And you knew he was coming. You'd see him coming. You'd try and position yourself to keep him from scoring. And he would do this. And he had a deep, low voice. And he'd go, ho, ho, ho. Hey, DJ. And he'd around you and score the goal. And there was nothing you could do. He was our secret weapon. We knew no matter where we were in the game, how far we were behind, Michael and Randy, they can pull it off. They set us up for a win. And, uh, and I remember that. And uh, we depended on them. Friends, from Romans 8, it reminds us we are more than conquerors through Christ. He's on our side. We are his. He's ours. And he's working on your behalf to set you up. Where are you this morning? Where are you in your life this morning? Have you put your faith and trust in the person of Jesus yet? Maybe you haven't. What greater time than today, this morning, to put your faith and trust in the person of Jesus and simply say, Jesus, I need you in my life. Will you forgive me? Help me to walk with you. Help me to know who you are and whose I am and to walk in that. You know what I love about that is he always answers that kind of a sincere prayer from the heart. He'll do it for you today. Maybe you're here today and you're in the middle of a storm and things are going on around you and you just feel like I need someone to pray for me. We have a place right there on the, on the web page you're on to click and ask for prayer. Someone will join you in a chat room to pray with you. Or maybe you'd like to put it on the connect card. We encourage everybody to fill that out every Monday at staff meeting. We do a Zoom staff meeting. We pray through the list of needs that have come in that week from, from that weekend gathering. So we encourage you to jot it down there. Maybe today you're here and you need to be reminded he knows your name. He knows who you are. He does. And he's working on your behalf. He's setting you up. Let me pray with you. Can I do that? Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, you're such a great God, an awesome God that loves us so much. Thank you for using people like the Apostle Paul a long time ago to write some words that would build faith in our heart and remind us of who you are and whose we are as we put our trust in you. And Father, we pray for each of those today. Some are going through difficult times. Would you meet them where they are? Begin to set in motion a plan. Help them to begin to see how your hand is working on their behalf. Father, for that person or those people who are here today who are saying, Jesus, I need you to be Lord of my life. Meet them where they are this morning. Help us as we walk with them on this journey to get to know you better. Because of faith, Lord, as you know, we love to help people find and follow Jesus. So we commit all of this to you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for staying with me here. I have two things I want to share with you before I go. One is this. We've got a great day, June 8th. Mark it on your calendar. You want to be a part of it if possible. We're partnering with Convoy of Hope. They're bringing in a semi-truck with 32,000 pounds of food, 16 tons. And we're going to be giving it away to our community. We love doing things like that, serving our community in all kinds of ways. So we've invited some other area churches to partner with us that weekend. And we'll do this serving by giving food away. If you'd like to be a part of that, you can mark the link there. And we'll get in touch with you with details. So that's June 8th. Second item is uh, Governor Inslee this week. Some of you heard the announcement. And uh, we're excited as we were. He's opened a window, not a door. He's opened a window, though, so that we can gather together 100 people outside. And so we're planning on S Sunday, June 14th, to gather out in our field. We'll have 100 people there. We can also have people in cars. So if you're not one of the 100 to get to sit outside social distance with your lawn chairs, we're going to have a live worship band. The message will be there and so on. You can sit in your cars and we'll pipe it in via the radio, the FM radio station. So it's going to be an exciting day. We will have online gathering as well. So it's not an either or, it's both and. So plan to be a part of that great weekend. It's going to be awesome. God bless you.
Uh, we're excited. I cannot wait to be a part of this Convoy of Hope food giveaway. It's going to be an incredible opportunity. I love that we get to, to be a part of that in our own community, not just helping feed people around the world, but right mm -hmm. here, people who are in need. Yeah. If you want to help finance that, you can do that by giving online. And one of the categories is local outreach. If you give towards that fund, that money will go to help finance this food giveaway that could be feeding some of your own neighbors. Yep. And then an outdoor gathering, that's going to be oh, a blast. It's awesome. It's going to be a blast. Get out the lawn chairs, the little picnic blanket, whatever it is. We're going to have some more details coming to you in the next couple of weeks. So make sure you mark June 14th. Don't miss it. It's going to be amazing. We'll see you soon.